Tak eh. So the reason we're um, focusing in on breast cancer screening um, is that it's obviously a it's common that there's a mutation in these particular genes, and we'll get more into the reason why in a little bit. But um, and then because it's it can lead to a known disease that is obviously can be fatal for some people, um, and it increases the ch that mutation increases the chance of you getting that disease. Obviously, a lot of people are turning to wanting to be screened for this. So. Genetic screening, while we know how to do it, and um, now that we have uh, the human genome totally sequenced, it, it's not about whether or not the mutation is there or not. That we can do, it just becomes really expensive to find that point mutation, because again, it can just be like a little snip, right? And remind yourself what a snip is. Mm, anybody? No. Is it coming back to us at all? <laughs> so SNP is a single nucleotide polymorphism. So it just means that one letter is changed to something else. So if in a sequence we had A, A, G, T, and only one of them was changed, now whatever, um, whatever amino acid this was supposed to code for, now it codes for something different. Unfortunately, that can be a detriment. <clears throat> so that's, a, that's all it takes um, in the breast cancer genes is for there to be one small mutation. And scientists have found that there can be up to 500 different types of mutation in the breast cancer one and two genes. Um, and and that alone is hard enough to find. That's like a needle in a haystack. Um, so we have two BRCA genes. Everyone does. Men and women have two. BRCA stands for breast cancer gene, one and two. And normally, when those genes are functioning, they function as tumor suppressor genes. And those tumor suppressor genes code for tumor suppressor proteins. And those proteins are the ones that can help repair DNA during the cell cycle if something goes wrong. And if those proteins find that the DNA is irrepar irreparable, then they can tell the cell to do what? Apoptosis. Yep, you got it. I'm not really sure I spelled irreparable right, but hopefully you got it. How are we doing? Going too fast? Good? Medium? Feeling okay? Good. This is probably kind of review, you know, where you're thinking about, okay, this is some kind of gene that has to do with cancer, so that it's got to be either a tumor suppressor gene or it's got to be a... Anybody? Or it has to be 
a proto oncogene that has become an oncogene, right? So it's either there, it's either in our system to help stop the replication of cells, or it's in our system to help promote the replication of cells. In this case, this particular gene, when it acts totally normal, then it's going to suppress um, cells from going out of control. Now, if it's mutated, of course, then we have um, no check or you know nothing to tell the cell to stop replicating if it's done, done something wrong or it has a mutation, and therefore that cell starts to grow out of control. And this is pretty common. Like I said, to the tune of about 500 different mutation types. And normally, especially in women, there's about a 15% chance that you will develop breast cancer. So about a one in six, one in seven chance. Now, if that same woman has a mutation in their BRCA gene, then the chance of developing cancer goes up significantly. Anyone know how much? Was it like 20% or something? Oh, if no. only. I thought it was 12%. So 12, so in, in our reading, the 12% that it gives you is what is the normal chance, which is too long ago now. Now, unfortunately, it's more like 15. And if you have a mutation in the BRCA gene, it goes up almost 60% to 85% chance of developing breast cancer. That's why it's so scary to have a BRCA mutation because your chances of getting breast cancer are pretty high. Now, no one's to say that that particular cancer is gonna be super aggressive or worse than another type of cancer. It could just mean that you will develop some kind of um, mass in the breast or ovaries. And you know, if not taken care of, then it can be detrimental. But maybe just knowing that you have um, knowing that you have that mutation could be significant, um, significantly helpful when you're moving forward with your own, you know, um, choices in life. How are we doing? Okay, okay. Um, so the thing about the whiteboard in Zoom is that once I get to the end of this page, I can't scroll. I have to create a new page. So um, just shout out if you need more time on this page. While I need a tip. Okay, moving on. Okay, so let's talk about Judy and her family. Judy's a little shook by the fact that her son was just diagnosed with osteosarcoma. So as we know, Mike had osteosarcoma. And she started to think about, oh man, you know, cancer kind of does run in the family. Because as we talked about in our last unit, cancer can be hereditary. It can be familial. And it can be sporadic. So specifically, she's thinking, man, I have a lot of people in my family. My dad had cancer. Um, it was breast cancer and it was super benign, but he did have it. Her mom was diagnosed with breast cancer and one of her sisters so far. So she's kind of thinking, hey, to her other sisters, like, don't you think we should be tested? This is kind of important. Um, it could mean that we have a chance of developing breast cancer. So she's trying to convince her family to go ahead with some screenings. Um, and that's where we come in. Basically, she's going to come to the clinic and say she wants to be screened for those BRCA genes.
The problem is looking for the exact mutation is really hard, like I mentioned, and expensive. And that's because if you think about your DNA, um, actually, let's try that again. If this is just a strip of DNA, oops. You can imagine that in that length of DNA, you've got lots of different genes. Um, and they can code for all kinds of different things. And on this particular strip of DNA that I drew, you not only have two random genes, but you also have the two BRCA genes. Now, this isn't necessarily how BRCA lies out on the DNA, but we're just using this as an example um, so that we can visualize a little bit, it, bit of it. So if those genes code for important proteins, what type of DNA segments would you call those? Any thoughts? If it's a coding region of DNA. Something that repeats. Okay, good try. So these are called exons. Exon regions of DNA are DNA regions that actually code for proteins. So when mRNA goes into the DNA and looks for what it wants to make a copy of or what it wants to pull out and start making proteins out of, it is only looking for exons. And it ignores all of the stuff in between. So if these are all exons, what's all the junk DNA in between, Paul? Introns. Good. So introns are non-coding regions of DNA. And for the longest time, these were not of interest to scientists. It was like, okay, we just realized we don't, this, none of this gets coded for, just throw it out. It's not important. But it turns out it can be a great indicator of what genes are coming next because they can contain what are called short tandem repeats. So the point of our experiment is to understand why we're going to look at these short tandem repeats instead of looking at the actual gene itself. So if we looked at um, the gene itself, so like if we pulled out BRCA here and we looked at what BRCA actually was when we blew it up, and it was like AAGT, G, T, I mean, you can write whatever you want. It does not matter because this is not exactly what it really is. But if, if we had this super long gene that was like 100 plus base pairs long, and actually, let's just make that real because BRCA is actually one of the bigger genes. It can be up to 1,000 base pairs long. And because of that, if you're just looking for one singular mutation in the, gene, in the DNA, like this G changed to a T instead, then the problem is finding that with PCR or restriction enzymes is literally a needle in the haystack. And that's why it takes so long, and that's why it's so expensive, is because scientists have to try over and over again to see exactly where that mutation is. And then not for nothing, not only is can there just be one mutation, but like I said, there can be up to 500 different types of mutations within the BRCA gene. 
So this is not efficient at all. So let's write that. So instead of trying to look for that one single SNP in um, the BRCA uh, genome, we're going to look at what comes before it because it's always the same. It doesn't matter who we are, man, woman, young, old, doesn't matter which family, your particular short tandem repeats are going to be the same. And I'll explain. So let's see. Uh, STRs are consistent across all BRCA gene regions. So promoter regions are the regions that come before a gene. So if we're looking at my little picture here, the region before BRCA1 is uh, this area right here, and the region before BRCA2 would be this promoter region. So let's just take a look at the region that we have right before BRCA1. So if we pulled out that particular short tandem repeat, we may see something like, here's that other gene that we don't really care about. Here's the promoter region. And here's BRCA1. In here, we may see a bunch of short tandem repeats. That means that each one of these segments of DNA is something like AAGT. AAGT, AAGT, AAGT. So if you're looking at these, how many short tandem repeats do I have in my BRCA1 promoter region? Four. Good. There are four sets. Not for nothing, maybe you're kind of being thoughtful about where you've seen this before. Anyone remember where we've seen um, repeated DNA sequences that help us find a coding region? It's our favorite. Mr. Crisper. Just like CRISPR is a like a heat-seeking missile for DNA of interest, these short tan tandem repeats are similar because wherever we find them before a, a specific gene, we can use that to know that the gene is present. Now, one person might have four short tandem repeats before their BRCA gene, while somebody else, completely different, might have only three instead. The point is, it's easier to count these chunks of DNA when we're doing PCR than it is to actually find one singular nucleotide change. So I'm going to switch to the next page in about 20 seconds after I get another chip.
Alrighty. So we know that when we do PCR, what are we doing? What is PCR? Polymerase chain reaction. Yes. So what is it that we're doing when we are doing a polymerase chain reaction? What are we doing with a small piece of DNA? Amplifying the gene. Perfect. Oops, got to spell it right though, huh? So if we were trying to find a SNP <coughs> using PCR, we would have to use primers to flank just that small little area that we think we might have one nucleotide change. And that's really hard to see. And so then in addition to that, we would have to use a restriction enzyme to see if it cuts or not cuts. And it, restriction enzymes is where things can get expensive. So again, um, oops. <clears throat> using PCR plus restriction enzymes is expensive. <coughs> So we don't want to use it to find a SNP. However, when we want to find short tandem repeats, if we just say, hey, PCR, find the repeat AAGT, depending on how much we have, is going to tell us how big our bands are. So it can say, it, um, the PCR will find, if it finds, like let's say from our last example, if it finds four short tandem repeats, the band is going to be thicker. Whereas if it only finds one short tandem repeat, the band is going to be smaller. And then because of that, it's going to move down the DNA at different speeds. So let's kind of try to draw a picture. Okay, so here are four different people that have four different um, amounts of short tandem repeats in their DNA. So uh, patient one, patient two, patient three, patient four, where patient one has four sets of short tandem repeats. Patient two has three. Patient three has two. This is not really <laughs> good nomenclature, huh? And patient four has one. Really, we should be naming these the other way around, huh? Let's do that so that we're not confused here. So if I take all of these patients and I run PCR on them and I'm looking for, you know, a promoter region, or I'm sorry, a primer region that looks for the end of this gene and the beginning of this gene, right? So here's my primer region. It's going to be the same for every single person. That part doesn't change because the gene itself is not changing. I mean, there might be a mutation, but it's probably not right at the beginning where it's not in a region that's going to be affected by the primers. So all of our primer region is the same, but the piece that they cut or the piece that they amplify when in the PCR machine is going to yield different size bands. So if then I have a gel for myself, where my first lane is a ladder, and then I have patient one, patient two, patient three, and patient four. 
when I put that PCR product into, so let's say here's patient four, and I put that patient's product into the lane, how big do you think, I mean, do you think that is like a big um, honking piece of DNA or is it like a teeny tiny one compared to the rest of the patients? Is it our biggest or our smallest? Smallest? Right, it's, oh, oh sorry, no. It's our biggest one because it's got all four, right? So it's got AAGT, 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 AAGT. So it's our biggest piece of DNA. So when it starts moving through the gel from the negative end to the positive end, it's only going to move a little bit because he's so fat. Does that kind of make sense? So we put the DNA in the well, we turn on the electrophoresis chamber, it moves down, but it only moves down a little bit because it's so big. Whereas patient three, patient three has three STRs. So when we put patient three into the well and it moves down, it's a smaller piece of DNA, so it gets to move down a little bit further because it only has three. Eamon, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, good. So then say back to me what happens with patient two. How far will patient two move down? Won't it move down farther? Good, yes. Patient two, because it's an even smaller piece of DNA, is gonna move down further. Because again, smaller things can move through the gel matrix faster. And then last but not least, we have, oops. What color have we not used? Yellow. Patient one, who has just a small one um, STR, and so patient one, their DNA will move down the furthest. How are we doing? Okay, here's the last little kicker of the idea of STRs and why we're gonna look for these instead. So this was nice and easy. Now I can see clear bands and I can tell which patient has the most STRs. In this case, if I was just looking at the gel, I could easily say that patient four has the most STRs and patient one has the least. However, um, if I have a gel that looks very similar, I just realized I never put um, my ladder in here. Remember, a ladder just tells you how big things are. So if I had um, a gel over here to the right that I got from a technician and they ran the gel for me and I'm trying to decipher what's going on with my patients. And I have patient one who has two bands. I have patient two who has two bands, patient three who has two bands, and patient four who has just one band. What's going on here? Why do all these patients have two bands, making this particular gel actually not correct because they only have one band each? Why would my patients have two bands? if we're talking about genes. Um, is it because of how many times they were, the genes were cut? Um, good thought, uh, no. Anyone else have any thoughts? 
I wrote a hint down for you. Why would they have two bands for talking about someone's genes? Because it comes from both parents? Yes, yes, yes. amen. Sorry, thank you. Hold on, sorry, I had to join the teacher meeting too. You guys want to see the teacher meeting in action? Yeah. Yeah. Can you see it? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, let me just turn her. Up. Um, it's definitely be something that you're going to want to consider um, based on what your, you know, what your preference is. Okay. Okay, sorry. We just have to have um, Dr. Gooden in the background a little bit here. Okay, so yes, Amen got it. It's because we have two different parents. So each one of our patients is going to have one copy from each parent. And one parent might have given them a promoter region with four STRs, and another parent might have given them a promoter region with just one STR. So if we look at maybe patient two, for example, Patient two clearly has one parent that gave them a large STR. And then their other parent gave them a short sequence of STRs. So then what's going on over here with patient four? There's only one parent giving it out. Okay, how would that work? If we have to have two parents, how can only one parent give a gene, right? We definitely have to get one copy from each parent. That's just, that's just bio. We have to. They have the same one. Yes, Christina. Was that Christina? Yeah. Yeah, Christina. That means that both parents get